Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, many of you have asked for a video where I would talk about my story. And let me just say up front, that it is not my intention to glorify sin or the sinful practices of my life. I want this story to point to and glorify Jesus in all ways. You see, I have resisted in putting out a video about my story because it is Jesus alone who is to be glorified. And yet I understand that it is through the changed lives of those whom he has touched that he is most glorified. And so after much consideration, I have given myself to the idea and the requests of many that this might be necessary. And so I can only hope that you would find hope through this testimony of what God has done in my life and that it would help you be a better follower of the Lord Jesus. Now, where to begin? I'm approaching 52 years old, and so as you can imagine, there are many life experiences that have filled those 52 years. There are many people who play a part of what I have experienced in those 52 years, and yet I will forego mentioning any names, although I may talk about certain events. Well, I was born in Arkansas in 1966, to what might be considered by many a hillbilly family. And what I mean by hillbilly is old-fashioned. You could even say poor and humble in many ways. My mom and dad worked at a local factory, and my dad's favorite pastime was country music. And so you can see just a brief glimpse of where my life might have been headed. Although not too long after I was born, God reached down and touched my dad and changed his life. Within a matter of years, my dad had become so dedicated to the Lord and the service of the Lord that my dad entered into the ministry. Now, mom, of course, went with dad and served in her own place of ministry as well. They had become affiliated with the Salvation Army and was moved by the compassion that the Salvation Army offered to those who were often forgotten. Now, up until this point, I obviously was raised with my cousins, my younger brother, and a few friends that I had met in school. By this time, I'm probably between six and eight years old. But this is a major turning point in my life because in the Salvation Army, One of the practices that they have is not to leave a preacher or a minister or more technically an officer of the Salvation Army in any given location for any length of time. To give you an example, as I said, I'm going on 52 years old and I've lived in 55 different cities in my life. By the time I was in 10th grade, the school had actually lost my records. So they asked me what grade I was in, and of course, as most teenagers would, I lied. I told them I was in 10th grade when I should have been in the 9th grade. Well, back in those days, we're talking the late 70s, Algebra 1 was taught in 9th grade, Algebra 2 was taught in 10th grade. Well, because I did not receive Algebra 1 and had any idea of what Algebra was all about, when I arrived in 10th grade Algebra... I could either tell the truth and expose myself as a liar, or I could just quit school. And so I took the easy way, and and I just quit school. Well, many things had happened between the age of 8 years old and 16 years old when I quit school. For example, I experimented with drugs for the first time. I experimented with sex for the first time. I experimented with alcohol for the first time. And these things led me into a progression of rebellion and maybe even curiosity where one thing led to the next. 
By the time I was 17 years old, I was using intravenous drugs and on my way to prison. And it's funny because a lot of times in life when we experience bad things and yet years go by, we look back and we realize that those bad things weren't really that bad at all. And God used this as a pivotal point in my life to allow me to see the transgression of my ways and his judgment for rebelling against him. As you can imagine, I was raised by Christian parents. And although they set out to teach me right and to train me in the things of God, the rebellion within me as a child led me into many disastrous ways. Well, needless to say, even though in my rebellion, my stubbornness in my teenage years, God certainly got my attention. And so I began to seek God. I felt it necessary to move myself from the environment that I was in to a new place where I could start afresh. And that's exactly what I did. However, when I arrived there, I began to practice some of the same things that I had left behind. Yet God still seemed to be alive and at work in my soul. And so upon rededicating myself unto him, one of the first things that I can remember is a passionate, burning desire for the word of God. I remember spending hours in my room just reading the Bible, marking and underlining, looking up certain passages, certain words. I had an insatiable desire for the word of God. Because as much as I wanted to know God, it seemed I could only find him in his word. Well, as a young Christian, it also seemed I would find him in the church. So I began to attend a local church. Now, this church in many ways was Pentecostal in its practices. And yet as a young believer, even though I knew the Bible spoke against certain practices, such as speaking in tongues in public, I still wanted to be a part of something so much that I pushed those things to the side because the man there was still preaching the word of God. He still loved Jesus with all his heart. And I shared that love for Jesus with him and others in the church. Some of the most beautiful friendships that I've ever had were established in that church. One of the things I remember about that experience was that it, it seemed that most of us who attended that church had a real desire to love Jesus, to know Jesus, to practice what it was that we were learning from Jesus, about Jesus, in the Word. And so there was a real fire there about the people, about the preaching, about the music ministry. And I have to say it was a fire that I have not experienced since then. Now, I am a firm believer that God is in control of everything, and everything happens for a reason. So if we truly believe that, we can't say that we would go back and change anything, because if we were to change one thing, that would change everything. But if I were to say that I would go back and change something, I would have never left that church. Not necessarily for the preaching or the music ministry or even the Pentecostal practices, but it was simply because of the relationships that I had with the people in that church. They were my brothers and sisters, and I truly loved them with all my heart. But feeling the call of God upon my life, feeling the desire to offer what I had to the masses, I followed the customary practices of pursuing a ministry and found myself in Bible school. Now, as hungry as I was for the Word of God, and as much as I anticipated learning from men of higher knowledge, I was terribly disappointed with my Bible college experience, not only from the lack of depth that I received in the teachings at the college, but most of all from my fellow pastors in training who were attending that college with me. You see, many of them were participating in rated R movies with no conscience about those things at all. They were listening to country and rock and roll. These are things that the Lord Jesus had set me free from. And so I was very confused to see those who called themselves Christians, much less pastors in training, to be practicing such lifestyles. 
And yet it was very commonplace, very well received and accepted, even by the professors in that college, who many themselves were practicing such lifestyles. And this caused me great confusion because when I read the Bible, I see a very clear black and white line. But when I looked around me and I fellowshiped with others and spoke to others about these things, I saw that that line was very blurred. And so this caused great damage in my Christian journey because I was alone in my beliefs. And as a young follower of the Lord Jesus, being alone, it felt so much more comfortable to conform rather than to resist. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe they were all right. I just didn't know. Because of this, there was a seed of doubt, a seed of questioning that was planted in my soul. And I began to look very carefully at the church as we know it, at denominationalism, at tradition. And all I saw, which most people see, was hypocrisy. Now, it took many years of pastoring for that seed to grow and bear fruit, but eventually I left the church. Now, this is probably around 1995, and from 1995 until 2005, I really didn't darken the doors of a church. And even though I wrestled with many sinful practices in my life, God never left me, and I never lost the desire to learn and study His Word. Now, when I say sinful practices, I'm talking about deception. I'm talking about lying. I'm talking about cursing. I'm talking smoking marijuana, drinking beer, indulging in sinful practices and activities that I knew God had frowned upon, but in many ways I felt lost. And there was no one there to pick me up. There was no one there to help me. And so the only thing I can do, as I've said many times, when we lost everything, we look to the Lord. Well, that's exactly what I did. I buried myself in the pages of Scripture. And the more I read, the more convicted I, I became about the way that I was living. And so I brought those things to the Lord in humble surrender. And I watched my life begin to be transformed by the renewing of the word. The word of God was getting inside of me and changing the outside of me. But most of all, something very interesting was taking place because I began to see, even with good intentions maybe, how much I have been lied to by people who teach and preach the Word. I began to see that there is a Bible within the Bible. There is a hidden message that God desires for each of us to discover if we will only open the Word and read it. And you're not going to find it upon the first, the second, the third, or the fourth reading. But the more you read the Bible, the, the more the Bible opens itself up to you and you begin to see the secrets of the wisdom of God that lie beneath the surface of the pages that you're reading. Well, as I discovered these new revelations, I wanted to share them with others. But what I found that these revelations were the depth of the Word of God. And yet so many people that I talk to and share with were so shallow in the things that they understood. So again, I found it impossible to find someone to share with me in what I was experiencing. And so my journey, friends, has been very lonely. Even to this day, I don't have one single person that I can sit down with, open the Bible, and really share in the deeper things of God. Now, I'm not saying this so that you'll feel sorry for me, because what I have discovered is this is the way of the master. Jesus felt very alone. He tried to share spiritual truths with the disciples on so many occasions, and yet it says they did not understand what he was saying. They would come and ask him to explain it, and even in explaining it, you have eyes to see, but you don't see. You have ears to hear, but you don't hear. That was his response to them. And friends, I feel the same way. Many times the things I'm trying to share with others, even in our ministry here on YouTube, is like trying to explain the color blue to a blind man. I can't show it to you. You have to see it for yourself. 
Now, I know that at this point, I have passed over many details that you would probably be curious about in my life. But I told you up front, I'm not going to spend any time on those things. Here's what I can tell you in short. I am no different than the people of Israel. If you've read the Old Testament at least once in its entirety, you're going to notice something very significant about them. You see, God was the God that they were born to serve, but they chose to follow the practices of the world. God judged them and punished them for their acts of rebellion. They repented under that punishment and came back to the Lord. The Lord forgave them and life was good. And shortly thereafter, they went back to the practices of the world. God punished them. They repented. Life was good. They went back to the world. A continual cycle over and over throughout a period of 2,000 years. And this has been the experience of my life. But there came a day when a light went off and things changed. I can't tell you what that day was. Maybe I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Maybe I got tired of the lies and the hypocrisy. Maybe I got tired of pointing at everyone else about their lies and hypocrisy and began to look at my own life full of lies and hypocrisy. But something changed. And I turned to a passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. And I made it my life's work, my life's commitment. If my people, and I am his people, he called me from a very early age. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that was step one. And that's exactly what I did. I admitted my wrong. I admitted my shame. I admitted my guilt before God. I humbled myself. I determined to seek his help because it was only his help that could change my life. If they will pray, well, that's exactly what I began to do. I began to talk to God from the depth of my heart to be real serious about the matters of my life. If they will seek my face, you see, prayer isn't enough. You have to really get serious with God and begin to seek him more than anything you desire. I mean, if you can imagine yourself being held under water to the very brink of death, how bad do you want that next breath? That's how bad you've got to want God. That's how bad you've got to want his work in your life. And I wanted it, friends. I was desperate for it. I could not live without it. And then the final step was turn from their wicked ways. So I had to be very transparent with myself and outline what the wicked ways in my life were. And one by one began to rid myself of them. Rock and roll, rated R movies, sex outside of marriage, alcohol, drugs, lying, deception, prejudices. The compromises had to stop. The justifications had to come to an end. And I had to get serious with God, humble myself, pray, seek his face, and turn from my wicked ways. Then he will hear me. Then he will heal my land. And friends, that's when my life was revolutionized. That is the moment where I became an empty vessel and the Lord Jesus began to pour truth through his spirit into my life, through his word into my life. And things I once read and did not understand now made perfect sense. Because I didn't see them with a carnal mind, I saw them spiritually. And the more I read, the more they began to intertwine. And as separate as all these passages, chapters, and verses were, they began to link together and become one message. And the more I surrendered and became obedient to each truth as it was revealed unto me, the next truth followed closely thereafter. And that brings me to where I am today. You see, there are many people that pushed me for a very long time to begin a teaching ministry, specifically on YouTube. And I resisted because there's nothing special about me. But at the same time, I have to acknowledge that for some mysterious reason, God has bestowed a gift upon me and I would be selfish and I would be dishonoring his name if I did not share it with others. 
But I always want to be very careful in pointing to myself, mentioning myself, having any significance or pride in myself or in my journey. Now, I feel that this has probably raised more questions than it has given you answers. But if I could offer you one truth from my story, from my journey that would benefit you the most, do not look to those around you, to the majority, even if you're in a church, especially if you're in a church, those who call themselves Christians, don't seek approval through them. Because if you're doing things right, if you're obeying the Word of God, if you're reading the Word of God, if you're following what His Spirit is churning to do within you, you're going to be ostracized, friends. You're not going to be accepted. You're going to offend people, many people, those who you care about the most. But don't allow them to change your course. Don't let them change your journey. That's what I did. That's where I was wrong. I was foolish. I was young. I didn't know any better. I, I certainly didn't have anyone guiding me. And those aren't excuses. Those are simply the truth. But I'm here to guide you, if I can, even through this simple statement. Don't let others change your course. You stay the course, no matter what happens in your life or around your life. No matter who comes or who goes, you stay the course, friends. Stay true to the Word of God, and you will remain blessed by the God of the Word. You see, friends, when we get to the kingdom, there are no perfect saints walking through those gates. You're going to see crippled, wounded, bloodied soldiers, birds with broken wings, scarred and damaged hearts, but it is because of these battle scars that we become the men and women that God has so called us to be. I pray that your journey will be blessed. I pray that the words I've spoken today will bring you some kind of fruit in your life, will challenge you and bless you to be a better follower of Jesus. For I have to say, I feel this is inadequate in what I've set out to accomplish today. But I trust that the Holy Spirit will speak it as life into your soul. Now may he forever be blessed as we his people seek to serve him. And may the Lord Jesus alone be glorified in all we say, all we think, and all we do. Until the next video, friends, I love you, and I'll see you then.